The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into boats and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they had found him across the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Amen, amen, I say to you, you were looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father, God, has set his seal. So they said to him, What can we do to accomplish the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in the one he sent. So they said to him, What sign can you do that we may see and believe in you? What can you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. The Gospel of the Lord. We're continuing uh, to make our way through John chapter 6. If you weren't here last weekend, uh, I'll sort of summarize what we're doing. Uh, because to me, John chapter 6 is the basis of a lot of the differences between Catholics and other Christians. And it all comes down to this chapter of the Bible and what we believe about the Eucharist. And what we believe, what we believe about the Eucharist as Catholics is why our churches uh, look different than other Christians. What we believe about the Eucharist as Catholics is why we have a sacramental system, why we have confession and the priesthood. What we believe about the Eucharist as Catholics is why we hold attending Sunday Mass so dear. There is a really good reason to attend Mass, and that is to receive the Eucharist. It's the reason why we have daily Mass. It's the reason why we genuflect. It's the reason we have Eucharistic adoration. What we believe about the Eucharist as Catholics is why we have catechism classes, because what we believe about the Eucharist needs to be taught to our children, and only those who believe in the Eucharist can receive the Eucharist. So the beginning of John chapter 6 is the story of the feeding of the 5,000, and that was the gospel last weekend. And last weekend I explained that that particular miracle was not just a miracle. John, in his gospel, refers to it as a sign. And a sign is something that points to another deeper reality, something else. And in the case of the feeding of the 5,000, that's a sign that points to the Eucharist. There are obvious connections between that event in John chapter 6 and the Last Supper, which happens obviously towards the end of the John's Gospel. And it's at the Last Supper where the Eucharist was instituted as a perpetual memorial, and the priesthood was started as well. And the apostles at that point were tasked with distributing the Eucharist to every person throughout all of time. Now, at this point in John chapter 6, none of that's explained yet. He, Jesus hasn't gotten that far. Uh, he hasn't explained what exactly the Eucharist is, what this sign really means, but don't worry, John chapter 6 is a long one, and we're nowhere near done with it. We'll be working through it for this entire month of August. So let's do what we did last week and go through our gospel passage for uh, today, and we'll do it sort of line by line. And I'm just kind of, once again, going to give you my thoughts as we go through. I probably won't give you all of my thoughts because we will be here all evening and not all of my thoughts are really that important. So we'll just stick with the big ones and uh, we'll get started. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into boats and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him across the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Okay, somehow, uh, Jesus and his disciples had given the crowds the slip. Uh, and that might sound ridiculous, but if you sort of think about it, there's 5,000 people there, and they're going to be kind of in their own groups with their own families and things like that. And that's a lot of people. And so uh, 
I have escaped from crowds much smaller than 5,000 people, uh, so I'm pretty sure that Jesus and his apostles could do it fairly easily. Plus, it was probably getting dark by the time they were finished uh, eating the bread and the fish. And it might sound ridiculous if they, this crowd went across an entire sea uh, to chase down Jesus, but uh, the reality is, is that the Sea of Galilee isn't that big. It's about the same size and shape as Johnson Lake, uh, north of Elwood, and uh, it's round and it's only a couple of miles across. And they basically knew where to find him. It was Galilee is not a huge area of land, and everybody knows everybody else. And Capernaum, which is where they find Jesus, well, that's the hometown of the first four apostles of Jesus, Andrew, Peter, James, and John. Capernaum was sort of like Jesus' headquarters throughout the first part of his, his public life. And it was a, a small town on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. You can see it from basically any other point on the Sea of Galilee. So here they have tracked down Jesus, and Jesus answers them and said, Amen, amen, I say to you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life that the Son of Man will give you. Basically, Jesus is telling these crowds that they're missing the point. They were amazed that he was able to feed them with such little bread and such little fish. But the real reason Jesus performed this miracle was to prepare them for something far greater, for far something far different than just being simply fed with earthly food. And I think for those who read this chapter of St. John's Gospel without understanding the deeper meaning of the Eucharist in it, you would be missing the point just as much as those crowds are. Jesus would have the same answer for you as he did for them. He would, be, he would say, it was never about the miracle. It was about the sign pointing to something greater. Too many Christians, even to this day, are making the same mistake. They read this story... And they tell this story to their children, and they are ooing and aahing about the crazy thing Jesus did with the bread, but they're missing the point of why he did the crazy thing with the bread. The, the greater reality of the Eucharist that it's pointing to. So they said to Jesus, what can we do to accomplish the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he sent. They continue to miss the point. Um, what can we do to accomplish the works of God? Like basically, what can we do to check off a list to, to have God do whatever he want for us? So basically, how can we learn how to do one of your magic tricks, Jesus? And, and they're, still, they're still missing the point in all of this. And so Jesus, once again, has to redirect them to point them in a different direction, saying, no, ignore the bread for a little bit. The work of God is that you believe in me. That's what it's all about, having a real relationship with Jesus. It's, it's easy to get frustrated with the crowd here, but they're making very common mistakes. They're making mistakes that we make. Hey, Jesus, can you give us some more bread? Well, no, I'd rather you have a relationship with me than just me giving you stuff. Our prayer can easily sound the same way, right? Hey, God, can... Uh, Here's my prayer intentions. Can you help me out? And God's response has to be like Jesus. He has to sort of just change directions for us. He has to, his, his answer to us will be an answer to an entirely different question. Because he isn't our magical wish granter. He's a person who desires a relationship with us. And that relationship is one of father and child. We're, we're not the ones that make demands of God. Instead, we should be coming to God as a child who needs to be loved and taught and corrected and healed. So don't get mad at this next line either, because we do the same thing. We do it all the time. They said to him, what sign can you do that we may see and believe in you? What can you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And this is sort of like a total palm to the face moment, right? What do you mean, what sign can you do? He just fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread. But how often can that be our attitude in prayer? Once again, um, that's 
like saying, God, what, you, what have you done for me lately? Maybe we don't put it that bluntly. Maybe we don't say it that way, but it's essentially what we're doing every time we say, God, just give me a sign, please. Or, or we start making deals with God. If I do this, God, then you'll do this, right? And we're missing the point, just like the crowds. We already know that God can do amazing things. We already know that miracles are real. We don't need proof of that. When we ask God to do something for us, that's not a relationship. That's, that's a business transaction. He's your father, not a cashier. He wants us to simply come to him, just to be with him. And to come to him with trust. And when we do that, we'll never have to ask him for anything again. Because that means we trust in him and everything that he he does and provides for it. I know that trust is difficult. It takes time. In our own personal wounds and shortcomings, they get in the way of trust. But listen to the words of Jesus. He desires a relationship. Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Here's a reason to trust. God gives us bread from heaven, and that bread must be far better than the breads that the crowds were interested in. The crowds were interested in the, the here and the now. They're looking for a Messiah that would free them from the rule of the Romans and restore the kingdom of Israel back to the glory days of David, the king himself. But this isn't what Jesus offers us. Jesus never offers us material comfort. He never promises financial security. He never promises an easier life. That's not what God is about. Jesus is trying to get the people in the crowds and to get us to realize that we're, we're not made for this world. We're made for God. And so Jesus responds by saying that he is the, the true, that, that God is the one that gives the bread from heaven. In our first reading, we had the story of the Israelites receiving bread every day in the desert. And this sort of like the feeding of the 5,000s is another sign that points to something in the future. The entire Old Testament, in fact, is that. It is a preparation for Jesus. And so this is something that Jesus fulfills. The feeding in the desert of the bread of, that came from heaven is something that Jesus not only does to the crowds, in feeding them, but he does to us continually with the Eucharist. We'll see more in the coming weeks how that works. And just as the manna, the bread from heaven, quit the second they entered into the promised land, it, kept, it quit coming from the floor of the desert, so for us, when we make it to the other side of this life, we'll no longer require the Eucharist. We will have the real thing that in the presence, in the flesh, God before us always. And so we're left with this last bit. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. I am the bread of life. What does he mean by this? Well, like I said, he hasn't explained it to us yet. Does he mean that he's actual bread? Does he mean that he's actual food meant to be eaten? Are these words meant to simply be spiritually understood? By bread of life, is Jesus meaning that he is our spiritual nourishment? Well, yes, but there's a but. There's so much more. And we'll have to see what Jesus tells us next week to find out. I hope you come back. I hope you tune in. Uh, because we'll be hearing from John chapter 6 for the next four weeks. And we'll... We'll continue this discussion about the Eucharist.